Okie dokie. Good afternoon. My name is Veronica Williams and I have the honor of serving as the president of the Willamette Women Democrats. And I am very excited to be welcoming you and to be welcoming two of Oregon's first term state representatives, Con Pham and Wimsley Campos. And I'm so glad that all of you could join us. We are looking forward to being back in person and hope to be able to do so in January. But meanwhile, we continue to bring you our programs via Zoom. A few housekeeping matters. As you have joined us, we have muted your speakers and turned off your videos. We do this to improve the overall quality of the transmission of the program and to help ensure that our speakers will not be interrupted by accidental noises at your end. So unless I specifically call on you, please do stay muted and with your videos off. Please feel free to put any questions for the representatives in the chat. After the remarks, we will be introducing elected officials and candidates in the room, and then we will get to your questions. If you have not yet had a chance to renew your membership or to join for the first time, it is not too late. Membership and PAC information can be found online at w2dems.com. Your membership makes these Zoom programs possible. And I thank everyone who has already sent in their renewal or has joined for the first time. Your contributions to our PAC make it possible for W2D to support state and local candidates in important races. Today is Veterans Day. Veterans Day originated as Armistice Day on November 11th, 1919, the first anniversary of the end of World War I. Congress passed a resolution in 1926 for an annual observance and November 11th became a national holiday beginning in 1938. Unlike Memorial Day, Veterans Day pays tribute to all American veterans, living or dead, but especially gives thanks to living veterans who served their country honorably during war or peacetime. A few numbers. As of April of this year, there were 19 million living veterans, 11% of whom are women. Of the 16 million veterans from World War II, 240,000 are still with us. There were nine, 133,000 Korean conflict veterans, 5.9 million served in Vietnam, and 7.8 million during the Gulf War era. So today we recognize all veterans and especially those that are still with us. I'm pleased to introduce our program chair, Nancy Murray, to introduce our guest speakers. Nancy? Good afternoon. Our two speakers today may be new to the Oregon legislature, but they are definitely not new to tackling big important issues and making positive change. Representative Khan Pham's parents immigrated to the United States after the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. They met in Oklahoma, married and started a family. Khan grew from the shy bookworm of her childhood to flourishing in the diverse surroundings of Irvine, California. Lewis and Clark College gave her a full scholarship and accepting it was a decision, she said, that changed her life. Her first job out of college was community organizing in South LA. Khan began by speaking with low-income Black and Latinx bus riders about their lives, their search for jobs and housing. They organized together to fight the systems of transit racism and environmental injustice impacting their lives. In Oakland, California, she worked as a grassroots fundraiser and community organizer with groups drawing connections between immigrant justice, climate justice, and workers' rights. She helped produce radio programs that reframed climate change as a racial, economic, and gender justice issue. There is nothing like seeing firsthand how climate change affects lives and livelihoods. It takes the issue from abstract science to real world consequences. 
In her regular visits to her family in Vietnam, she witnessed how the growing impacts of the climate crisis, from stronger hurricanes and severe flooding to saltwater intrusion and extreme heat, were hitting the poorest and most vulnerable communities first and hardest. In her desire to develop more skills and expertise to address the, this crisis, she enrolled in a PhD program at Portland State University to study urban planning and climate change adaptation. Khan recognizes that her young daughter and her daughter's generation will experience a greater crisis, necessitating a greater effort on our part today. She started working at the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, and over four years, she built their environmental and climate justice program. Wins a representative Wednesday Campos also brings a family history that broadens the perspective she brings to Salem and her district. She is the youngest member of the legislature at 25. Her young age reminds us that her life will experience a harsher, more unpredictable climate should we continue down this path of doing too little too late. That urgency is needed to counterbalance the powerful forces of the status quo. Winsvey is one of the few lawmakers of color. For perspective, people of color represent 13% of the Oregon legislature, but make up 24% of Oregon's total population. She brings the lived experience of homelessness and poverty growing up in Bend and Oregon, often living in motel rooms with a single immigrant father who worked hard to make sure she had opportunities. They relied on food banks and going to the public library. She attended Pacific University in Forest Grove to earn a bachelor's degree in political science and philosophy. Returning to Washington County that really supported her, she now represents Aloha and West Beaverton. Apart from legislative duties, Winsvey brings her expertise on homelessness as a case manager for Family Promises Beaverton, a transitional housing program that helps families experiencing homelessness obtain stable housing. Political organizing experience working for Our Oregon and Oregon Nurses Association brought further urgency to roll up her sleeves and work for comprehensive system level policies that address the root causes, not only of our housing challenges, but also our education system, healthcare, and the climate crisis. As co-chair of the House Interim Committee on Housing, Winsfey is in an excellent position to put her firsthand knowledge of this critical issue into laws that do more than superficially address this persistent issue. We are so pleased to present to you two extraordinarily talented young women who represent us as public servants in the truest sense of the term. Welcome to you both. We'll hear first from um, Representative Fan. Would you like to say a word first? Yes, I'm happy to say a word. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with everyone. We, um, Winsway and I, I think we'll be trading off. We were sent some questions to guide us and we thought it might be more engaging if we could just kind of um, answer some of the questions and really have a dialogue. I'm really looking forward to the conversation here with all of you today. But first, um, thank you so much for that really in, uh, thorough introduction. I don't think I've ever had such a well-researched bio or introduction uh, before. And I really appreciate just, um, I feel like you covered a lot of uh, what I would say in terms of why I decided to run, um, in terms of just who I am and and what drives me. I, one thing I will add is that I, you know, even with all of that, I always thought of myself, and I still think of myself as a community organizer. Um, I, you know, when I was at Apano, I, I I was manager of immigrant organizing, and I also helped to build the environmental justice program there. And as part of that, I got to build this coalition for the Portland Clean Energy Fund. Um, back in 2016 and 2017. And in that experience of getting ready for building the coalition so that we could launch a ballot measure initiative called the Portland Clean Energy Fund uh, was just something none of us had ever done before. And really many people thought that we couldn't do it. 
but we, it's probably good that we were kind of ignorant of this, of what was involved. Um, we didn't have any funding really. It was just us kind of finding volunteer time. But that experience of talking to neighbors, talking to small businesses, talking to, to immigrants and, and people of color, low income communities about the opportunities that a transition to a clean energy future would offer was what kind of gave me my first taste of, of the power that we were building. You know, when we, we, we won this on an almost two to one basis in November of 2018, and we realized there is a progressive majority here that wants to see climate justice in climate action, but in a way that centers racial equity and economic justice. And so we, um, so after that, we, people were thinking like, oh my gosh, we've built this incredible people power. What are we gonna do next with it? And then the opportunity to, um, to run for this seat came up when my predecessor, Representative Alyssa Kenny Geyer decided to step down after nine years. And I was asked by Apano to run because I, um, because I, I live in the Jade District, which has a very diverse district um, and it has one of the highest concentrations of Asians and Pacific Islanders in the state of Oregon, but we've never had an Asian or Pacific Islander represent us in the state legislature. So for both those reasons, both because we needed to, I felt really an urgency to take climate action and also wanted to represent and give voice to communities that haven't, haven't had a voice in the legislature, um, I decided to run for office and yeah, I, uh, I'm continually, continually still uh, inspired and move and just moved by this opportunity to be able to, to, to work on things that I'm so passionate about. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But Wednesday, do you want to take it away? Sure. Thanks so much, Khan. Um, and thank you, Nancy. I will echo what uh, Khan noted about the introductions. Um, I feel like you just set the bar. Um, so thank you. Um, I, you know, would agree. I think you mentioned a lot of the reasons um, that I ran for office and um, how I ended up here this evening uh, as a result. Um, and it is a pleasure joining you all this evening. Um, I will note that too. Uh, but I, I think what I would add is, you know, and, and uh, Rep Pham Khan uh, noted, noted this as well, um, the, the representation um, that herself and myself both bring um, to communities who have not had um, voices in so many of these spaces for far too long. Um, I, for me, what was really the catalyst to make the decision to run was having conversations um, with the with the clients that I served at the time working as a case manager. Um, had a day at work where I started the day out on the phone with somebody who by the end of the phone call knew that they were gonna be sleeping outside. And I ended that day with a mom breaking down in tears in front of me, asking me how she was supposed to put a roof over her children's heads when she works 40 hours a week, but only makes minimum wage. And she laid out what those numbers meant for her. And I sat at my desk feeling really angry and frustrated. And I thought to myself, what we need is change at a policy level. We need people that are on the front lines of the most pressing issues that we're facing, but we also need more people in that building with diverse lived experiences, people who know what it is to, um, to really struggle, to stand in line at the food bank, to um, grow up without um, easy access to internet. In the introduction, it was mentioned um, that I spent a lot of time in the library. Uh, my family, we could not, we couldn't afford childcare, um, and that's certainly an issue that we um, continue to see that has been perpetuated throughout the pandemic. Um, but we couldn't afford childcare, so my dad was at work, and uh, I would spend uh, my evenings after school, um, if he wasn't done with work at that point in time, at the library amongst the books, um, doing my homework on the library computers. We also couldn't afford internet at that time, and so certainly spent a lot of time there. But there were these things that I saw growing up um, as somebody who's the daughter of immigrants, as somebody who grew up in a low-income house. Hold, um, seeing the ways in which our systems have been set up to not necessarily benefit families with a background like mine. Um, I saw racism really early on. I was that kid at the grocery store, at the doctor's office, at the bank translating for my dad because we had moved from Los Angeles, California, where um, a lot of people spoke Spanish, to the little town of Bandon down on the southern Oregon coast. 
uh, where lovely community, uh, where we were one of, at that time, two families of color. Um, and so while my dad's English was getting better, uh, because I was that translator, I was exposed to racism um, in, in some of those conversations. And so um, in a lot of the work that um, I have focused on in both my career and in the legislature thus far, you know, I really want to do what I can to amplify voices of these communities that, again, don't necessarily be get to get the opportunity to be in these rooms in these spaces. Um, so that's that's what I'll add. Um, and I think Rep. Fam, am I sending it back your way? Yes. And so the next question um, they sent was, what is your focus and expert or expertise or what are some of your fo focuses, Bokai? Um, um, you know, for me, there's so many issues. I don't think uh, as, as people who, who represent different communities, we don't get to be single issue. Um, we, ha we have to be able to address multiple issues. But for me, one of the reasons I really lobbied hard to be on the revenue committee is because I felt like equitable taxation and revenue was really central to why we've historically underfunded education and healthcare and housing and can't fund the kind of climate interventions and renewable energy projects that I wanna see. And so um, I am really focused on both environmental justice and climate justice, as well as taxation and revenue, and um, as well as making Oregon a welcoming state, most recently working with Senator Jama on a work group for Afghan arrivals um, to make sure that the 1200 Afghan re refugees that we're expected to get um, in the next year or so um, have the supports that they need to be successful here. It really, it was very, really heartbreaking for me to see pictures of the fall of Afghanistan, the fall of Kabul um, in, in images that really reminded me of the fall of Saigon and the same kind of, um, just panic and just quick pull out and just there's so unfortunately so many parallels in US history and military intervention and just really wanted to make sure that the refugees that are coming over now get the supports that they need, especially facing um, you know, a housing crisis here where even, even people who've lived there for years can't find decent housing for their families. So I'm um, just wanting to make sure that we're bringing state agencies together, um, whether it's the employment department to think about how can we offer job, job opportunities, job training, and the Department of Education and Early Learning Division to think about how we can make sure that the, the young people coming over actually have um, some culturally specific supports to help them transition to their new schools. Um, and most importantly, housing coordinators to help them find um, housing. So anyways, those are three areas that I'm focusing on. Of course, there's so many more, but um, that's that probably covers um, a lot for now. Lindsay, are we rep down plus? Uh, so focus and expertise. Uh, well, so I ran on three things uh, when when I ran for uh, this, this seat. I ran on housing, uh, climate change, and healthcare. And certainly given the fact that I was placed on both the healthcare and the housing committee, very much focused on those um, and kept in tune with what was going on with the bills that we worked on this last session um, around addressing climate change. I uh, felt very proud to have voted um, and supported in whatever ways I could. A lot of the work that um, folks like Rep. Pham and Rep. Marsh um, really championed during the session. Um, but as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, I myself grew up housing insecure and am the vice chair of the House Housing Committee. So housing is a big priority of mine. And obviously with the pandemic is a, is a huge issue that we're facing. We know, we've known for a while that Oregon is, is facing a housing crisis um, in a number of different ways that we see across different regions in the state, um, but it's only been perpetuated. And one of the things that I found really interesting during the session um, and on the campaign trail is when you would ask a candidate or a legislator what, what their top three issues was, um, 
I did not hear a single person whose top issue was was not who's one of one of their three top issues was housing. Um, and so I um, feel fortunate that I can bring perspectives from the professional work that I've done, um, but also from my own lived experiences. Again, folks that have these experiences don't necessarily always have access to these positions. So um, I'm grateful to be able to use that knowledge to work on issues, to have supported um, a number of different bills, to have supported a lot of funding um, towards housing resources. Um, another issue that is incredibly important to me is immigrant justice. Um, we see in, in the state uh, and across the country that immigrants um, are, are not treated as equals in a myriad of ways that really impact their, their livelihoods. And I'm, I'm committed to, to working towards addressing that. I was a chief sponsor and a co-chief sponsor on a number of different bills this last session. And I'm really proud to be able to work with uh, fellow legislators like Rep. Bam, like Rep or Senator Jama on, on these issues. And I'd say the other big focus of my office uh, are what we like to call, what folks like to call social determinants of health. So the things that aren't traditionally thought of as, as healthcare, but have significant impacts on, on folks' health. Um, and, and that's really looking at things holistically. Um, for example, it, I mean, it ties to housing, it ties to education. Uh, it's tough to um, really maintain one's health when, when you're not looking, when you're letting one, one ball drop um, and, and you know, just not addressing things the, the way that we really could be. So it's, it's about addressing health more broadly as a result of a person's life experiences. Um, I will send it back to you, Rep. Pam. Thank you, Rep. Campos. Um, so the next question is, what was accomplished during the 2021 session that you were part of and what was that like? Um, <laughs> It's a long story about what that was like. I mean, it was a virtual session, our first session. Um, and I think there's both uh, opportunities and challenges with being all virtual. I think um, it it was incredibly, I think it was incredibly successful in a lot of fronts. So I think, um, I actually don't know, to be honest. I actually, it's been, I'm not sure how to compare it, but I do feel like maybe, I, I guess what I do, what I can say is that the accessibility of the format, the virtual format that allowed unprecedented numbers of people to testify was really great. And I think it was democratizing because usually I think lobbyists <laughs> were not super happy with um, this session because they're used to being able to have exclusive, more exclusive access and so few people are able to, to come into the building and, and, and just kind of stop by our offices. Um, so that was uh, a, a change, but I think in, in to balance that out, we had so many people from rural Oregon, from across the state who would never be able to drive two hours to, or three hours or more even, or take, find childcare and just to testify for three or four minutes. Um, but, but through Zoom technologies and through Teams actually, um, it, it really allowed an unprecedented level of participation. So that's something that I really appreciated about this session and and hope that we will really continue to hold um, in terms of what was accomplished um, that i'm particularly proud of um, i think the suite of oregon clean energy opportunity bills um, that rep Gampos and i worked on um, as along with so many others um, uh, that that included not just 100 clean which is is critical to set a mandate for the state to 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 be 100 renewable by 2040 but also an energy affordability act which uh, allows the puc and allows utilities to be able to set differentiated rates or or discount rates for low-income households which is really key as we face you know heat waves and we need to make sure that energy is a human right and it's a life or death issue. And so we need to make sure it's accessible. Um, and lastly, a healthy homes bill, which directed $10 million towards a program that um, nonprofits can use to, to give grants for weatherization and um, any kind of home repairs that are needed, helps fire, wildfire hardening um, to deal with the increasingly extreme climate disasters that are coming. 
um, also 82nd Avenue, um, bias crimes response, and then just historic investments in affordable housing through the ARPA funding that was made available. But I'll let Rep Gompos talk more about that because um, she was such an integral part to winning these really the $765 million in, in these in housing investments. So uh, I would I would echo Rep uh, Rep Bam's notes about the virtual format of the session um, in terms of the way in which it made things more accessible for, for folks. But what I uh, would uh, like to share just really quickly is we heard um, as first year legislators we heard this is a historic session many, many, many times for many, many different reasons. And so while we left the building feeling as if we had accomplished a lot, um, we also, I mean, there were things that were unprecedented uh, that we worked through um, as, as a legislative body. And so that, um, that was uh, certainly interesting, whether it was um, navigating the pandemic or just some of the other issues that we saw um, in terms of, um, I mean, you know, we, we started, we were sworn in two weeks after January or a week and a half or something or other um, after January 6th. Um, and so we, on those first couple of days, for example, um, there was a lot of talk about security and, and thankfully um, we, we, we moved um, away from those conversations where we felt more comfortable, but there were so many things that made it this historic session that we were navigating. Um, and so I was really grateful um, to be able to uh, lean on the knowledge and advice of, of legislators that had been there, um, but also go in with this group. Um, there's an OPB article that was released after the session about how um, folks felt that this was a really strong uh, freshman class. And so it was really cool to be able to work alongside so many um, talented and knowledgeable folks. Um, in terms of what I would share as accomplishments that I am really proud of. Um, I would say that first our, like my office's biggest accomplishment of the session, um, our big priority bill was cover all people, um, which expanded Medicaid, expanded healthcare access to folks who would otherwise qualify for the Medicaid program were it not for their immigration status. Um, this is an issue that um, I've, I've, I've worked with folks who haven't been able to access healthcare because of, of their status. Um, I've seen um, so many folks go without that care and it truly is heartbreaking. And what we have seen throughout this pandemic is that falling ill, it's not something, it's not something that discriminates. And we know that the health of our neighbors, the health of our friends, um, it, it affects us, it, it affects us um, all as a community. And so it was past time to make sure that, um, it, it's past time that, that we make sure that we're doing what we can to expand healthcare access to, <clears throat> to all in our community. And so I was really proud to have championed that in the building and to have had so many colleagues uh, supporting that work along the way. Um, something else I'm incredibly proud of was something that Rep, Rep Pham and I worked on together uh, which was expanding the earned income tax credit to ITIN holders. Um, folks hold ITIN numbers for, for a number of different reasons, um, including those who um, have experienced domestic violence, for example, um, but also um, it uh, was a racial equity issue as well. And what we see is that our tax system uh, could use a lot of reform, and I know uh, Rep. Pham is uh, leading the way on a lot of these things, actually. Um, and I'm excited to see what she continues to do within our tax system. Um, but really proud that that's something that's a that's an issue we were able to tackle and break down. And um, so, just really quickly, uh, I'll just do one more uh, so that we can keep going. Um, Rep. Pham had mentioned. Um, that we had the opportunity to, uh, well, she mentioned with one of the projects that we did have this opportunity to allocate ARPA dollars to um, our, 
to our districts, um, which was really exciting. And what, what we did here in this district, we allocated money to building more public bathrooms in the Tarleton Hills Park and Rec District, Parks and Recs District, um, and uh, also to build permanent year round shelter for houseless folks in Beaverton, which we know is desperately needed, and also gave funding for Home Plates Youth Services Drop-In Center, as well as the Children's Library at the Aloha Community Library. And I just realized I didn't expand on the $765 million that Rep Bam referenced, um, but certainly as the Vice Chair of the Housing Committee, I was pretty involved in, in the various efforts to the distribution of millions of dollars in financial assistance, um, as well as efforts to, to protect both our renters and landlords through um, through financial assistance, through eviction moratoriums and various other protections, which we know we are still navigating. Um, and there are many conversations. I did see a question in the chat that I uh, will be quiet now so we can make sure we get the questions. Yeah, I was thinking we could just answer one more question um, and then just turn it the rest of the time over to Q&A and dialogue, if that's okay. So the last question is just, um, what unfinished work will you focus on this coming year? Uh, and that is, there's, you know, in the short session, I, we were only allowed two priority bills, but I feel like I'm actually very excited about supporting a lot of the bills of my colleagues. Um, Senator Wagner is introducing a, um, a, a race and ethnicity data collection bill, which usually people are like, what data collection, but it's so critical to our work to be able to understand the disparate impacts of different revenue policies to understand, oh, actually, when we give you know, uh, these kinds of tax credits or these kinds of um, deductions, it disproportionately benefits the wealthiest or, or this is actually one way that we can lift people out of poverty or, you know, it's or this actually disproportionately helps lowest income Oregonians. That's so important to, uh, or it disproportionately impacts BIPOC communities. Um, that kind of data collection is really important and we haven't ever gathered it. Um, so I'm excited about supporting that as well as farm worker overtime, as well as the Justice Reinvestment Act. Um, and as well as my own bills, which include um, a genuine progress indicator bill, which will mandate that state agencies collect, um, co uh, calculate metrics that can involve um, he health and social well being and not just GDP growth rate. It's an initiative that Oregon was exploring about 10 years ago. Um, under the previous go uh, previous governor, but um, other states have actually since adopted like Maryland and Washington and Vermont and uh, and they um, I think it's just really helpful to prompt a conversation statewide about the purpose of our economy really should be around well being and not necessarily around this growth for the sake of growth. Um, and then the second bill I'm really excited is um, Pacific Islander Student Success Act, which will allow school districts to have resources to do some um, planning and engagement to to make sure that their Pacific Islander students who are facing disproportionate um, dis disparities in their educational outcomes get the supports they need to, to be successful in schools. All right, uh, so I will share um, one of the ones that I, uh, one of the bills um, with the short session that I'll be bringing back, um, it uh, was introduced in the long session, but um, died in committee, unfortunately. Um, what was then called HDR 5, um, its intention is to remove Article 1, Section 41 from the Oregon Constitution and for those of you who, like myself, don't have the Constitution memorized, uh, that section mandates that incarcerated folks in Oregon work uh, 40 hours a week or are engaged in 40 hours of on-the-job training. And the intention of the bill isn't to take away these opportunities because we certainly want folks to be able to engage in work and on-the-job training. Um, however, right now that labor is mandated, um, so it's a labor issue um, because the way in which it is set up right now, it is a form of modern day slavery. So it is important um, as, as an office that prioritizes labor issues um, that we work to, um, to address that. Um, and because it is a constitutional change, it would be referred to the ballot. Um, but one of the things that I just want to note there really quickly is 
that we, outside of knowing, uh, recognizing that the way in which it exists in the constitution right now is um, problematic, um, there's this other piece where we know we've read the articles, my office has talked with folks that are currently um, incarcerated, who've shared the stories of the hazardous conditions that they um, have been put through in the work they've done, particularly during this, um, during this pandemic. Um, we heard stories of folks who um, were asked, were not asked, were required to, it was their time to do uh, laundry and would get laundry from uh, hospitals and and it was and they were exposed to um, these you know sheets and such that uh, were in COVID positive uh, rooms and were told that it was fine that there was um, that that wasn't true and were not provided proper PPE so we know that there are issues that need to be addressed and so this is a step that that um, my office will be uh, looking at taking during the short session. Um, and then uh, I'm also, as like Rep Fam, am excited about some of the things uh, that some of my colleagues will be working on that I will be supporting in, in whatever ways I can. Um, one of those is something that came up over the summer as a huge issue uh, is the right to cooling. Uh, so what that means, so some folks right now are banned from putting air conditioning units in their homes. Um, and it's it's frankly um, just to, and 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 some are some are some like specific units that are banned. But when you look at why it's important that folks are able to use those air conditioning units, um, they're they're more cost effective um, than some other units, for example. And so we know that this is an issue of inequity when folks can't afford um, to have these units, um, these units that maybe are allowed um, and aren't allowed to use these ones that their family could, could afford. And what we're seeing here is uh, that we, we're seeing the impacts of climate change. We're seeing summers that are getting hotter and so to, to deny folks the, the, this right to um, cooling, uh, it's, it's a safety issue. It's a human rights issue. Um, Senator Jama uh, will be bringing that forward. And it's a conversation that we've been having pretty locally. Um, a number of us have convened around this issue. And so we're meeting with his office pretty soon here to talk about how we can support that, that work. Um, and then, just outside of outside of bills, as I mentioned above or before, um, we passed this big bill, cover all people. And so one of the things that still has to happen after we pass bills is the is keeping an eye on the implementation process. And so now that the bill has passed, we've been doing coordination with the Oregon Health Authority and other community groups to work together to make sure that we're setting up the structures to implement the expansion, to do outreach to folks to get them enrolled and to make sure that we're being uh, responsible with uh, with state dollars and state programs. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we don't talk about enough is that that work still has to happen um, that legislators are involved with after, after bills are passed. I'm so excited about the cooling concepts or the access to cooling bill. Um, or the renters rights to cooling. I don't know what the final title is going to be, but um, that's so important. I think as somebody who is, is working on both the climate mitigation part, we also need to focus on adaptation to the really devastating changes that are already in the pipeline. And um, that that work is, I'm, I'm still heartbroken about the what 115 people or over 115 people who died in the last summer's heat waves and want to make sure that this that we prevent anything like that in the future. But um, with that, I think that we had some other questions, but I think it might be more engaging if we just open it up to question and answer so we can have just a more engaging and participatory dialogue. Perfect. Thank you both very much. Um, before we go to the questions, I do want to take a quick moment to recognize some of the elected officials and um, other special guests and some candidates in the room. I have done my very best to go through the list of who is with us. So if I miss you, please drop a note in the chat and I will acknowledge you um, as I'm going through some of the questions. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, welcome Senate Majority Leader, uh, Senator Rob Wagner is with us today. 
A former state representative, Margaret Doherty, has joined us. Uh, Felicita Monteblanco, who's the director with the Tualatin Hills Park and Recreation District, is here. Ben Bowman, who is the chair of the Tiger Tualatin School District and a candidate for the new House District 25 with redistricting for state rep. Um, Terry Prig Rigsby, who is with the Multnomah uh, Soil and Water, Water Conservation District um, and is also a candidate for appointment to Metro to fill the seat that has been vacated um, by longtime and outstanding Metro member uh, Bob Stacy. I don't know that we can say fill his shoes or fill his seat, but um, certainly step in and, and uh, we wish you the best, Terry. And Valerie Pratt, who's on the Tualatin City Council. If there's someone else that I missed because I didn't recognize your name or I didn't have your complete name um, in the participant list, please drop a note in the chat and I will recognize you. And um, when we get into the questions, the first one I really wanna ask um, because we have not talked at all about redistricting, um, which I know kept uh, Wim's very busy for a good portion of the session, but will you both please uh, tell us the extent to which the current proposed maps impact you and your district? Um, so what, what changes are you personally going to see? So let's start with Khan. Sure. Um, what personally, what personal changes in my district? Um, yes. So my district, House, House District 46 is going to move kind of to the south a little bit um, and a little more to the south, I think it looks like. So um, I still will have parts of Mount Tabor, but not as much. Um, and I no longer have Laurelhurst um, and North Tabor, and I will be taking on more of Len a little bit more Lentz and Powellhurst Gilbert, um, as well as um, Foster Powell in the Woodstock neighborhood. So um, I think a little bit of Brentwood Darlington. I'm, I'm still kind of learning the bounds of my district, but it's not a huge shift for me. But um, but yeah, those are the, is that is that what your question is about? Yes, absolutely. That's exactly what I wanted to know. Winfrey? So, uh... Yeah, so I lost a significant amount of geography in my district. Uh, we had so much growth in Washington County, uh, which uh, my district represents uh, Washington County and unincorporated Washington County. So lost a lot of geography. What's interesting, uh, I tell people the way in which uh, that helps people picture it. Um, so I was previously in like the very center of the district. I am now on the very edge, the very southern edge of the district, because that's how much we lost of the southern part of, of this house district. Um, we also shift, the district also shifted a little bit north. Uh, so it now encompasses part of the Elmonica neighborhood in Beaverton as well. Um, and one of the interesting things too um, is that, it, the district, the new dis the new house district will be one of the, I think only maybe one of two or three districts in the state that will be a majority BIPOC district. So it will, it's, we saw quite a bit shift in, in this area. Great, thank you both very much. Um, for, I'm so well aware of the huge changes in Washington County that I'm not as well aware of how significant the changes have been in both Multnomah and Clackamas. And I'm sure since I know this whole area has grown so much, um, I'm sure some of them are pretty significant, but we've, we've seen huge changes in Washington County. Um, not so much in the House District I'm in, in House District 37, we just kind of knocked off a little here and added a little there. So it, it, it stayed pretty much the same. That's Rachel Prusak's district, but um, a lot of the others have changed quite a bit. Um, we had a question in the chat that I actually want to um, want to do. And this, because um, this is actually one of my pet gripes. Um, it's a question about what the Oregon legislators are planning to do to fix the Oregon Emergency Rental Assistant program. So it actually gets money to the applicants on a timely basis. And um, 
and then talking in general about what can be done to help individuals and families that may need rental assistance on an ongoing basis to stay housed. So do you two want to talk a little bit briefly about that program and what, what wall it ran into, <laughs> I guess is the way I would describe it, and, and, and what needs to be done and can be done to, to really have it um, reach its potential because it's so important. You want to start with, wait, go ahead, Wednesday. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, start us out um, as, as somebody who's serving on the housing committee. Um, certainly as much work as, as we put in to um, try and have those protections in place for folks, we, uh, the organizations that were the ones pushing this money out came across a few different issues. Um, one is that they didn't have, um, they shared that they felt they didn't have a system in place uh, that was ready for the amount of money uh, that, that came through. Uh, so I don't have the numbers top of mind, but what, um, what these orgs talk about a lot is that um, the, the money that they're pushing out is something or other around, again, I don't have the exact numbers, so don't quote me on this, but I'm just going to like give an example, like something or other, like five times, five to maybe more times the amount of money they push out in just, um, in just one year. Um, so it's, it's a whole lot more than they're used to. And so that meant that they didn't have this system in place and they also didn't have staff capacity. And so one of the things that I know they've done so far is they have contracted with, with a few outside companies that are coming in and looking at the rental applications are, and are trying to speed up the process, but they've really had to hire quite a bit. Um, and I think, um, so that's, that's one of the biggest problems is the staff capacity and the system that just, they had, they had to get a new one and then they had some hiccups in that system. And so pushing money out just became more of a challenge uh, than they might have anticipated. Um, and when we look at that being an issue, we have to take a look at, well, how do we set things up so that we don't come across these issues again in, in an emergency such as, as we've seen? Um, and that means that we need to invest in, in infrastructure. We need to invest in systems. We also need to invest in the people that are doing this on the ground work um, we see a lot of staff turnover in, um, in these services, in these systems, um, in these organizations, uh, because we have, I mean, we have folks that are paid um, maybe $17 an hour to do the work that they do in screening, in talking to people who are um, experience, experiencing trauma, for example, and at this point in time, there are places that you can go maybe work in retail or work in fast food um, that um, could, could be comparable to those wages. And so we need to make sure that we are investing in the folks that are doing this work um, in, and so, so that we have folks in place for something or other to come around again. But similar to what we saw with the unemployment agency, um, again, we just need to make sure that we are investing in, in these services, in these programs. Um, and in the more near future, because we know that this is an issue that people are facing, we know that there's an eviction crisis that's looming. Uh, there are many legislators right now that are calling for a special session so that we can look at solutions um, more uh, immediately. And I know that both Senator Jama and Representative Fahey, the chairs of the House Housing Committee and the Senate Housing Committee um, are in pretty in-depth conversations right now with the governor's office to see if that's something we can get done before the end of the year. Thanks. Um, So I think this one was uh, addressed to both of you, but um, the question is, what are the benefits and shortcomings do you see regarding Portland and Multnomah County's just passed 38 million homeless package? Are you familiar with, enough with the details of that package to speak to it? Or maybe a, just a broader 
view of what's going on in our community and what services are really needed and whether that's coming. Can you speak to that one, Colin? Well, I haven't seen the details of the 38 million, um, but yeah, I mean, I think in this moment, we have to be able to, to, do, to, to do both and. I know that there's a lot of tension between the rush to, to try to, I think sometimes people wanna have simple solutions to, think, to, to problems that are really complex. And I think we need to think about our, our historic underinvestment in addiction services and mental health and, and really, uh, and, and uh, counseling and, tr and transitional housing, and of course, more permanent, permanently supportive housing. Um, I mean, those are just, it's, we know the, the solutions, it's just not gonna happen overnight. And so I know people are expecting us to like, 30 million is gonna just somehow like, we're gonna see a difference right away. And it's, and um, I guess, I think what we need to do is have more honest conversations about the complexity of the problem and, and the kind of multifaceted strategies that we're gonna need to, to really, to make, to get at the root causes and, and really, respond in a way that's um, compassionate versus I'm um, just kind of trying to sweep, sweep people away. But Rob Campos, um, I really also look to you as, as a member of the housing committee for your insights. I, I think you said that perfectly, mm -hmm. huh? Brett Pam. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a question, um, does the Republican intransigence on climate solutions have any exceptions? What part, if any, of a transition from fossil fuels to renewables are they willing to support? So as, you, as you've been working on some of the climate related um, solutions, um, what, what are you experiencing in dealing with um, Republican members of the House and or Senate if you're, if you're working with them? Yeah, I actually do feel like there are opportunities. Um, there, I worked with Representative Mark Owens, who represents Eastern Oregon, and is very interested in the opportunities that um, solar and wind might offer for his district, but wanting to make sure that they see their communities reflected explicitly in the legislation. Um, but I actually think that energy is and can be even more so a bipartisan issue. Um, you know, I think I, I have just seen I have, yeah, I think my, rep my, my relationships with some of the members of uh, the Republican members on the House Energy and Environment Committee tell me that there is, there is possibility as long as we can um, build deep relationships of trust. And, and yeah, it's complicated. There's a lot of larger factors beyond um, just our committee that we're, we're, we're responding to, but I'm hopeful that um, just the economic opportunities, I think we really need to center and really talk about the, the workers who will be and, and communities that will be able to benefit from these investments. Um, and, that's, and that's where we've been able to find some common ground. Thank you. Um, uh, for Rep Compost, um, earlier this year, um, Beaverton Mayor Lacey Beatty spoke to us about the many ways her city is collaborating with organizations who are doing direct work with people in need. Um, how is your area faring and what improvements need to be made to make government's response to renters and landlords more effective, timely, and efficient? I know we talked a little bit about this in terms of the rental assistance, but um, I think there, I mean, obviously there's way more to the housing challenge than the current bill that's, that's looking to help us get through the impacts of COVID. So. Can you speak a little bit about cities and nonprofits working um, together with state to accomplish some of these things? So I would say it's certainly important that we have that collaboration going on. And I'm really grateful that um, to have a pretty good uh, relationship, for example, with uh, Mayor Beatty, um, I mentioned that there uh, that the cooling issue, for example, was a pretty local issue that was being talked about. Um, Mayor Beatty actually uh, convened a number of us uh, legislators and Metro folks and um, yeah, all, all to talk about the issue. Um, so we need to have more of that happening. Um, we also need to know, I mean, 
the uh, some of the ARPA dollars I mentioned went to um, both home plate youth services and a 24 hour shelter um, that uh, hopefully we'll see within the next couple of years um, pop up in Beaverton. And those were put on our radar by local government um, who knew that, the, that it was a need because they were the ones talking with the local nonprofits. And so um, we need to have more of these sort of like round table conversations uh, to hear on the ground, to hear from the people in the nonprofits that are doing the work, that are seeing those everyday problems. Um, and then also, how do we work collaboratively? One of the things that we hear often um, when an issue comes up that maybe this, maybe city entities come in and say, hey, actually, we don't support this, um, is because they feel um, like maybe there's work that they are already doing on this issue um, and want to make sure that the forward progress, forward momentum that they are already making um, doesn't, whatever we pass at the state, doesn't put them in a place where they're having to start um, from, uh, from like step one. Um, so certainly so that we can effectively serve um, the communities, whether it's rental issues, whether it's our housing or, you know, housing crisis and rental issues or other issues that we're seeing in the community, like maybe transportation, um, which is a big one that we talk about here in this area, um, is making sure that we're listening to one another and saying, hey, yes, I understand where you are coming from. I understand why the city government or the county commission can or cannot do this instead of just coming in and saying, hey, we as the state are going to pass this and um, good luck figuring it out. Thank you. I would also add it's important to think about to highlight the role of the federal government and the decades of underfunding and like like from the 80s on to housing it's it's really hard for states and localities to make up for decades now of you know we used to have real investments in public housing and so I, I don't know it's it's I just want to recognize the her Herculean tasks that the cities and uh, local jurisdictions are doing to fill fill in the gaps and states to fill in the gaps that the federal government has really reneged on. Right, yeah. huge a huge challenge to make up for uh, many years of disinvestment. You know, we talk about building. Um, you know, we talk about the infrastructure bill that just passed nationally and roads and bridges and um, you know expanding broadband and those types of things, but our housing stock is, is an arena that the federal government has actually for many, many decades been involved in and then just sort of stopped. And there was nobody prepared to step in and replace that effort. And we've just got further and further behind. So it's quite a challenge. Um, so I know, I know one of your major, um, areas of emphasis, Rep Campos has been looking at the things that need to be changed at the systemic level to address problems rather than just, you know, sort of frosting on the cake. And um, can you describe some of the system level policies that um, you're looking to address, um, especially the relate to root causes in our housing um, or houselessness? situation? Sure, yeah. So one of the things, and this was a controversial bill, I knew it would be, I also, sometimes you bring, sometimes a legislator brings a bill in um, to see what the conversation is going to be like um, and see where people stand um, because it gives, it gives some good information about how one could maybe tackle the issue later. Um, and the bill that I'm referring to is around the minimum wage. Um, so right now in Oregon, we have a tiered minimum wage um, and we have a minimum wage uh, that for many folks is not a living wage. And so I had introduced the bill uh, to address this. Uh, I believe uh, Rep Pham was supportive of this, of this effort. Uh, so thank you for that. There were a number of us um, that just that really wanted to bring bring it um, as a conversation starter and something that we could learn from so that we can um, really take a look at at what is a systemic problem. Um, 
minimum wage right now isn't just folks on minimum wage aren't just folks that are um, in high school um, that are going to make extra money. Um, we have single parents right now that are trying to um, sustain a household um, on minimum wage. Um, we have so many folks right now that are that are on minimum wage. And when you look at the numbers, um, I've, I've done the math before, I don't have it in front of me right now. I mean, don't have those numbers memorized. But when you look at how much someone works 40 hours a week versus the um, fair market rent in, for example, you look at Washington County and a two bedroom is some somewhere around uh, 1600 right now, I believe if I'm remembering my numbers correctly. Um, so you do the math and, and I encourage folks who are interested and who are like, well, what is, what is Rep Campos talking about? Um, do the math um, and you will see that it is not a living wage. Um, I mentioned that I had a conversation with somebody when I was when I made the decision to run who really laid out those numbers. For her, it meant that she was coming in $300 a month um, under what she needed to cover just bills. And it wasn't, uh, hey, you know, go budget better. Or, hey, go save $5 and not buy that Starbucks drink, um, which is what some, the talking point, points that some folks like to say, um, but it was really just, just the, an issue that we really see um, is perpetuating poverty, is perpetuating folks ending up out on the streets. People who are working really hard, who are working more than 40 hours a week, um, that are working a day job and also are doing DoorDash and Uber Eats um, and are leaving their child at home um, because they also can't afford childcare. Um, so it affects all of these different things. Um, you can't afford childcare which again is, is, an issue, which is an issue in itself. You can't afford um, to pay your rent and your electricity bill or rent and the internet bill. Um, and so you don't have access to internet maybe. And then that creates a challenge in the education space. So that's one of those issues um, that a number of us are really interested in looking at how that in itself is affecting so many of the other issues that we're seeing arise um, in the state. Thank that was you. a very long-winded answer. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Um, I have. I just have one other question, um, and that is, um, and I'm going to cite a bill number, but I think I will talk a little bit about what it's related to. So hopefully, you'll know what I'm talking about. So House Bill um, 2002 was introduced last year and made it through the house, through house rules and died um, death, you know, as one is likely to do in ways and means um, right at the end of the session. And um, can you both speak to that? And is that something you think is gonna be coming back up? Um, and can you do a bit better job than I would about explaining to our audience what that bill covered? Because I think it was pretty important. Do you wanna start uh, Rep Vaughn? Sure. Um, so House Bill 2002 is the Justice Reinvestment Act, and that was a bill that was developed in deep collaboration with community groups who are most, impact, most impacted communities, uh, which meant that it took more time, right? It, it was involved a lot of negotiations involving both, I think my understanding, and I don't sit on the Judiciary Committee, but my understanding involved police and um, our criminal justice system, as well as um, folks who have borne the brunt of our often racist disc, um, sentencing sentencing laws, right? So this would, I don't know the exact details to be honest, but it had to do with like rules around when police officers um, could pull people over and trying to minimize unnecessary contacts. If it's, you know, just a broken taillight or something like that, are there things that um, can, can police can just take down your you know, license and, and just send you, mail you in a citation without necessarily pulling you over and then, and then kind of escalating um, the, what, the interaction and also what people are potentially um, charged with. So I, I have to admit, I'm not an, a deep expert, but I strongly want to just center right now. We saw the last year of racial justice protests really lift up for people so many young people, people, uh, BIPOC communities, and people really, white allies, so many people really stood up and said, you know, we are recognizing racial injustice is, is an integral, has 
been an integral part of our system and we want to dismantle it. And so I think justice reinvestment is one, one attempt to really look at our, our criminal justice system and try to, to take away some of the most, um, some, some aspects of um, both sentencing and also police interaction that lead to the most harm in many of our communities. Thank you. Did you have anything to add to that, Rep. Campos? Um, for brevity's sake, I will say no. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank both of you very, very much. I think this has been um, a wonderful opportunity for our members to meet uh, two of our newer members. Um, I do think you had a pretty amazing freshman class and judging from some of the people I've seen starting to get into races, um, especially where there's open seats. I think you have a great potential in your sophomore year to uh, welcome some wonderful new freshmen. So um, I, I just really, um, I really look forward um, personally to see what, um, what new voices and different voices are, are bringing to our legislature and to how we look at our state and the quality of life um, in Oregon um, and, and how we can, um, as Rep. Fahm said earlier, uh, really lift everyone up and, and improve the, and look at it from a, how well you are living perspective rather than just um, a GDP perspective. I, I really like that, that response. So thank you both very, very much. Um, just a few announcements if I can find what I did with them. See, they're probably buried down here. There we go. Um, so a reminder that we do not meet in December. So our next meeting will be Thursday, January the 13th of 2022. We do hope to be able to meet in person at the Celebrate Center on Bangy Road where we used to meet back um, in the ancient days pre-COVID. Um, as is usual for an even numbered year, our legislature will be meeting for a short five week session beginning in February. So our January program will focus on learning more about what our legislative leadership priority bills are to watch and support. Um, so I encourage you to watch for our program announcement, which will come out in December for more details. Um, again, if you have not joined W2D or renewed, please do so by going to our website at w2dems.com. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Be sure you are fully vaccinated, follow health and safety guidelines, and please stay well, enjoy the holidays, and we do look forward to seeing you in January. Thank you all very much and have a good rest of your evening. Thanks everyone. Thank you all.